Hi everyone, welcome to my channel or welcome back. Uh, I'm back at home and it, today I wanted to talk about um, some uh, promising results from a clinical trial that were reported uh, last month, March of 2022, uh, at the uh, Muscular Dystrophy Association uh, conference as well as uh, by uh, a press release and a conference call uh, by the company developing it. And this is uh, the trial of Ribitol for limb girdle muscular dystrophy um, type 2i or R9. And uh, I previously did a video about um, this treatment and how it, you know, how it's supposed to work and uh, the approach and all of that, how um, it interacts with the cause of the disease. Uh, but at the time, uh, no, really, no results from the trial had been released. Uh, so now they have, and I'm gonna go over that. This clinical trial is in two parts. Uh, the first part was just observational. It lasted uh, about a year. Uh, the patients were enrolled but weren't treated, uh, but they were followed just to see how uh, the natural history of the disease progressed over a one-year period of time. Uh, then in part two, the patients were started on treatment with Ribitol. Initially, uh, three different doses to see um, whether you know all the three doses were safe and what degree of effect they had. Uh, eventually, um, all of the participants were uh, put on the highest dose because there weren't any significant uh, safety concerns. So in uh, the presentation at the MDA conference and in the company conference call, it presented the data from part one and some of the data from part two. Okay, I did a presentation uh, on uh, Ribitol uh, in a previous video, but I'll just um, summarize it very briefly here. Um, there's a protein uh, called alpha dystroglycan in our muscles, and it's used to um, adhere the muscles' uh, fibers to the surrounding tissue. And the way that it does this is that there's a series of sugar molecules that are uh, stuck onto alpha dystroglycan by a number of different enzymes. So one of these enzymes is um, called FKRP, which uh, when mutated is responsible for limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2i or uh, R9. And this sticks a derivative of ribitol um, onto this glycosylation chain, which basically a, a series of sugar molecules. Now, the common mutation in FKRP um, makes it not be able to do its job very well. It still can do its job to some extent, but it doesn't work as well. So the basic idea is if you give the body more ribitol to work with, and then it goes through a couple other uh, chemical transformations, but if you have more of the molecule that the FKRP is trying to stick on to alpha dystroglycan, then uh, it can hopefully make up for uh, the fact that the mutated FKRP isn't very efficient. So as a comparison of uh, the, the ribitol treatment with gene therapy treatment that are being um, explored for different subtypes of LGMD as well as um, other diseases, um, gene therapy uh, puts a good copy of uh, the gene with uh, no defects 
uh, into the body. So it really um, addresses the root cause. Now, ribitol, by contrast, um, is sort of one step removed from that. The people still have uh, a mutation in their FKRP gene. The protein doesn't do its job as well, but uh, giving them extra ribitol is a workaround. Um, on the positive side, uh, ribitol is very easy to manufacture. It's um, just a slight chemical transformation of ribose which um, you, know, you can you know, buy at the store or online. And there's very little safety concerns, which uh, kind of is an issue in gene therapy, uh, as well as the gene therapy drugs being very difficult to manufacture. So um, in terms of the things that the FDA or other regulatory agencies look for, uh, it has to be able to be manufactured in a reliable manner. It has to be safe and it has to be con uh, effective. So um, manufacturability is uh, not a problem, uh, not much in the way of safety concerns. Uh, it's a question of uh, is it going to produce a significant enough benefit uh, that uh, it's worth uh, approving this for patients. Okay, so how do you test whether it's working? Well, here's some of the um, things that the uh, that was presented uh, in um, the conference and also in the conference call. Um, you're looking for um, is the alpha dystroglycan uh, being better glycosylated? Are the sugar molecules getting stuck on like they would be if the FKRP was normal, which is the whole thing that the uh, ribitol is trying to compensate for? Um, so they tested, they took biopsies both before and after the treatment. Uh, and looked for the relative amounts of glycosylation uh, of alpha dystroglycan with and without the treatment. Uh, are the CK levels uh, dropping? Okay, CK is a muscle enzyme which in most forms of muscular dystrophy is very elevated because the uh, muscle fibers um, are easily damaged and they leak out CK into the bloodstream where you can detect it. Now, there have been some treatments where um, it made people CK drop, but it didn't actually help their muscles. However, uh, if uh, you really are helping their muscles, then uh, CK should drop. So uh, one way of putting it is that uh, a drop in CK is a necessary but not a sufficient indicator that the muscles are being protected from damage. But it's easily measured, so they you know, took a number of blood tests to see how people's CK levels uh, responded to the treatment. And then there were several functional tests on uh, how the people were actually doing before and after starting the treatment. Uh, there was a few different ones. They only reported data for um, the 10 meter walk test, how fast they could you know, walk uh, a 10 meter distance. Um, the, the rest of the data is still being analyzed. Okay, so um, what is the summary of the results? Okay, they found that the glycosylation, uh, the amount of sugar molecules stuck onto alpha dystroglycan increased, uh, which is what they were hoping for. Okay, so that was a success. Uh, the CK dropped by uh, roughly 70 to 80 percent. Now, CK can vary quite a bit uh, just normally, if you, you know, test someone on a weekly basis, it, it might uh, 
fluctuate by as much as a factor of two, just depending on you know, how they're active they are in other things. In this case, it dropped uh, 70 to 80%. Um, that's pretty significant. Uh, in uh, gene therapies, um, CK has been seen to drop uh, maybe you know, 80 to 90%, a little bit more, but uh, a 70 to 80% drop, particularly um, that's the average over um, several people. Um, so that's a good sign. And the walking speed increased slightly during the treatment. And what's significant about that is remember they had the same people in just the natural history portion of the study and uh, observed them for a year before starting treatment and their walking speed dropped as the disease progressed, which is what you would expect. But then those same people um, were able to walk slightly faster once the treatment started. Now, this was a small group of people. They weren't really looking or, you know, have the ability to prove statistical significance. Um, but, um, you know, this is an indication that, uh, you know, not only does uh, the glycosylation increase and the CK drops, uh, but, you know, there's at least one indicator that their performance is doing better. Okay, so what are the plans for the drug developers? Uh, what they said in um, their press release and uh, in the um, conference call with the analyst is, okay, they're um, uh, still collecting data on phase two of the current study. Um, then they plan to meet with the FDA to you know, get uh, the FDA's guidance on the next steps of the study. Uh, what they ho are hoping for is to start a phase three uh, pivotal trial. What pivotal means is that if it's successful, um, that's something that could potentially lead to the drug's approval. Uh, and they hope to start that trial uh, within the next year. You know, there weren't really any negative things um, that were very significant that were found in the trial. Uh, the only, um, you know, really um, adverse effect of the treatment is that um, it caused um, stomach upset in some people. And the conclusion of that seems to be that it's something that um, you probably don't want to take on uh, an empty stomach. What they started doing was to just tell people, um, you know, take it after you just had a meal. So um, this is um, very exciting and, um, you know, we'll see what happens going forward.